All right, my name is Captain Irving, and you're in F Troop. Now, oh, kitty. The 1950s and early 60s were the age of the TV western. Wyatt Earp, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, Bat Masterson, Gunsmoke, Lawman, Rawhide, Sugarfoot, Bonanza, Have Gun, Will Travel, Cheyenne, Wagon Train. My dad watched them all and therefore so did I. Mainly because if he was in the room and the TV was on and you touched the dial without his approval, you got to leave the room. With all that, spoofs were bound to happen. Today, we start looking at one of the more successful ones. In the closing months of the war between the states, ultimate victory has been reduced to a question of supply. Nowhere a shortage is felt more keenly than in the headquarters tent of a certain general of the Union armies. Where is my laundry? Hmm, serious beginning, indication that something crucial is coming, sudden emphasis on something that has nothing to do with the war effort, totally incongruous. Yes, I believe we have successfully navigated the first joke of the show. Wilton Parmenter, Quartermaster Corps, member of a proud Philadelphia family with great military traditions. He too has found a place to serve. Private, in charge of officers' laundry. We're rushing through this at a breakneck pace, but we'll discover there's a valid reason for it. But this time, fate takes a hand. An excess of pollen fills the air. Get down! You heard it, man! Charge! And so, within a matter of days, victory came to the Union forces. And Wilton Parmenter, Quartermaster Corps, became a man of destiny. The scourge of Appomattox. This is the part they never taught you in school. An accidental charge led by a laundry boy won the war. Why wasn't this in my kids' textbooks? Wilton Parmenter comes from a long and proud military tradition. All his family members have come out to see him receive his medal and his new command. Except her. Wilton's first cousin, Major Achilles Parmenter. His second cousin, Lieutenant Colonel Hercules Parmenter. His uncle, Colonel Jupiter Parmenter. And his father, General Thor X Parmenter. No pressure, you understand. They all have super-powered names like Hercules and Thor. He's Wilton like a flower that's been in the vase too long. First, the medal. Promotion to captain, the Medal of Honor. <laughs> And the Purple Heart. He was the only soldier in history ever to get a medal for getting a medal. Then his new command. Sir, they've gone through three commanding officers at Fort Courage. Two desertions and a nervous breakdown. Fort Courage, eh? Ah, good thinking, Worms Becker. At a frontier post like that, he might be just the inspirational leader they need. Captain Parmenter, as of this moment, you are the commanding officer of F Troop. That's why we dashed through all this stuff. It's not important. It's backstory to tell you how he wound up there, nothing more. The real story starts now. I'd say the place has possibilities, wouldn't you? Let's meet the cast. Forrest Tucker was already a legend who had guest starred in most of those westerns I mentioned. Larry Storch, on the other hand, was pure comedy. Up until this show, he had mainly done cartoon voice work. Ken Berry's quiet demeanor and self-effacing style made him perfect for this role, as well as his later role on Mayberry RFD. Melody Patterson was only 16, but she forged a birth certificate, lied about her age, and got the part that launched a short but successful career. I like stories like hers. There are tons of recurring characters, but those are our core. Captain Parmenter's first official act was to get that guy a glockenspiel instead. He lived happily ever after, and so did Parmenter's ears. Sir, Sergeant O'Rourke and Corporal Agon reporting for duty. Uh, F troops assembled for the captain's first inspection. Good, good. May I, sir? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Sergeant. He wears that sword like he was born to wear something else. 
After he reviews the troops and takes care of a few other preliminaries, it's time to get down to the important stuff. <laughs> Dismissed. Important stuff like meeting the other member of the cast. Captain, I'd like to present to you Miss Jane Angelica Thrift. Annie, this is Captain Wilson Parment. I'm happy to know you, Miss Thrift. Shucks, you just call me Wrangler. Or Janie. I run the trading post here in town. Oh, well, then we'll be seeing something of each other, I imagine. You can bet a bucket of buzzards we will. If I had a bucket of buzzards to bet, I'd bet them all that he has no idea what you mean by that. She has a dispatch from Washington for him. Oh, so Sergeant, we've got to get things straightened up around the post companies coming tomorrow. Uh oh? Yes, our second Lieutenant Hawks from the Inspector General's office. Yeah. Darn, I just got here yesterday. Welcome to the Army, Captain. Well, I guess I could go check my manual. It's bound to have something in it about what you do with the second Lieutenant. When I was in the Army, we mainly laughed at them behind their backs. Going from being an enlisted man to a second Lieutenant is a bit like going from grade school to middle school. You're all set to strut your stuff because you're way above those losers back there in the old place, and then you suddenly realize you're at the bottom of a whole new pecking order. The big vocal sack deflates pretty quickly when you discover you're the little frog again. I tell you, Sarge, he's the pigeon we've always dreamed of. Yeah, now we get it. <laughs> Scourge of the West. Man coming out from the Inspector General's office, that could be the end of O'Rourke Enterprises. Sending in those phony reports about knocking off two tribes in two weeks, drawing rations for 30 men, and we only got 17. Phony reports, padding expenses, seems like pretty tame stuff, especially out west, where the Army pretty much took whoever wanted to sign up and didn't ask him any questions. If that snoop finds out how peaceful it really is around here, there'll be no more Fort Curry. Not necessarily. The Army did maintain outposts in peaceful places, just in case. But I'm not sure those outposts were operating the same way this one is. Look at all this beautiful loot. Arrows, quivers, bows, shields, tomahawks. 200 souvenir war bonnets. Four barrels of perfumed war paint. Welcome to O'Rourke Enterprises. Genuine Indian trinkets, souvenirs, garments, you name it, he has it for sale. The Hakawis, the local Indian tribe, make all this stuff. O'Rourke and Agarn sell it to the travelers who come through town and everybody cleans up. This is why they've gone through so many commanding officers. They were waiting for one like Parmenter, who's about as clueless as a mosquito in a hurricane. Is that all the whiskey I got? Now, how do you expect me to run a saloon with a half a case of whiskey? I told you, Sarge. Chief Wild Eagle says they need a copper coil for the still. All right, get one. Tell Supply it's something to, to repair the cannon with. The Hakawis also distill the whiskey that the town sells. It's a nice operation, and it's making everybody tons of money. Incidentally, to the sticklers out there, I'm going to keep using the term Indian because the show does. In 1965, we didn't have a better one, and I'm not convinced that we do yet. Native American is a bit of a misnomer because nobody's native to this continent or the one attached to it. Everybody who ever was here immigrated somehow. When it's something official, I go with the flow and say Native American, but in normal conversation, I prefer to say First American. It's more accurate and has fewer syllables. Can I make it catch on? No, but you could. Hint, hint. Whatever we call the Hakawis, our heroes are going to need their help to deal with this snooping lieutenant. Wild Eagle, my brother. You some brother. Still, still busted. How you expect Takawi make fire water? We'll get you a new coil, and when we do, Stop holding out liquor for the tribe. Indians ain't supposed to drink alcohol. Yeah, it cuts into the profits. Yeah, that just nasty rumor spread by sister-in-law sparkling water. <laughs> the plan is to have Wild Eagle and his warriors attack the fort while the lieutenant is there. Oh, it won't be a real attack. Shoot into the air some, right around the fort, whooping and hollering, then pretend the soldiers drove him off. Just enough to convince this guy that fort courage is necessary to keep things quiet here. You got wrong tribe, brother. Akawi's not fighters, invent peace pie. Akawi's <laughs> not mad at nobody. Listen, Wild Eagle, either you're gonna fight or you're gonna go back to hunting and fishing. And weaving your own blankets. We fight. There's just one problem. To go to battle, they have to do a war dance. They've been peaceful for so long, nobody remembers how. So Agarn will have to show them.
Uh huh. I think he learned that one from another great warrior, Anson Pants. Hear me, Shug Warriors. No kill. Follow. They lead us to fort. Shug's attack. We kill many pale face. I think we all know what's going to happen, but this show makes it funny. First, we have to deal with this shave tail. <laughs> that about face was nice. The way Ken Berry plays it, you can believe Parmenter would do that. The inspector has some questions. You draw rations and pay allotments for 30 men. Where are the others? Yeah, they're out on uh, patrol. That's right. That's right. Uh, they've been out on that patrol since before I got here. That's interesting. How do they draw their rations and pay? Oh, they're Indian scouts. They sneak in during the dead of night. <laughs> sneak out before dawn. <laughs> oh. Parmenter's reaction makes that joke. Besides the obvious slapstick, the fake Indian battles, and all the rest, little things like that were what gave this show the magic that allowed it to catch on pretty much immediately. I was 12, so all I knew was it was funny and I wanted more. This guy seems to be all business. Let's see if we can distract him a little. <laughs> Welcome in present for you. Put your initials on it myself. Oh, well, will you look at that? Oh, it's nice and slippery for a fast draw, see? Oh, thank you, Janie. Isn't that something? Gorgeous. So far, so good, though Jane doesn't seem to be too happy about it. Say, why, why don't we all go inside and have a nice cup? Hmm, that's not supposed to happen. Parmenter demands to know who did it. Really. <laughs> My goodness, there's an awful lot of Indians out there. The ferocious Akawas are about to attack. I have another line, but I cannot read Sergeant O'Rourke's handwriting. Oh, Captain, oh, Captain. Now let's watch the Scourge of the West in action. Uh, uh, Dobbs, uh, blow the charge. The, the attack. The, <laughs> blow the bugle. <laughs> Never mind, just yell. Indian attack. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there, there, there. Those archers are either really good or really bad. Oh, Captain. Charge! Inspector Lieutenant may have some questions about the methodology, but it's hard to argue with the results. Wait a minute, wait a minute! We ain't supposed to be in here! The fight's outside the other gate! Come on, assistant good! Oh, come on, assistant to get yourself! <laughs> Incidentally, somebody didn't get the memo about the fake Indian attack. trying to do kill somebody he says what am i going to tell the chief she'll wipe out the whole tribe Hoppin horn toads. <laughs> hey they sure missed you close some hakawis are getting good what do you mean hakawis they're the shugs the shugs <laughs> commence firing but for real it's the shug i don't think we're supposed to ask why she can tell the tribes apart but the professional indian fighters can't the Shugs are still coming despite volleys of real bullets from the fort. It's time for Parmenter to take a personal hand in this battle. Hey, somebody get that arrow out of there. Yeah, I'll take care of it, Sergeant. Some gags are universally funny. Captain Parmenter is a hero again. And the best part is the guys carrying him didn't even notice. He must not weigh much either. The Shugs lost 24 men. Jane shot 17 and the collective sharp shooting of the entire fort got the other seven. 
O'Rourke Enterprises is back in business. All is well except this lieutenant is a nut for ceremony. He says, it's time to blow retreat, the time of day when you take down the flag. Captain, I can't play retreat. That's the one I don't know how to play yet. <laughs> what do you usually play? Yankee Doodle, sir. If he can play Yankee Doodle on a bugle, I am officially impressed. And there's just one problem with this plan. Not only was the cannon pointed at the entire O'Rourke Enterprises inventory, firing the cannon was the signal to start the fake Akawi attack. And away we go. As I said, the show was instantly popular. It helped that Get Smart premiered four days later on a different network, so we had two great new spoof shows to watch in the course of an average week. It was running against Hollywood Talent Scouts, a show nobody remembers that bombed big time, and the final season of Dr. Kildare with Richard Chamberlain. So it was positioned well to get good ratings, and it did. Dr. Kildare's ratings were sagging, and the show would be canceled at the end of this season. To top it off, F Troop came immediately after McHale's Navy, one of the most popular World War II spoofs of all time. Talk about a golden opportunity, and they ran with it. We'll talk more about that next time. But until then... Keep your head down. There's Hakawis out there. If you're enjoying this, be sure to click the thumbs up button to show you like it. If you're not subscribed yet, punch me in the face right here and get it done. And don't forget that you can become a patron and help keep this kitty fed. The link is below. Until next time. You know, I would love to stay here and just keep petting you, but I really need to do this. And you're helping so much. You're being a very difficult co-host. <laughs>